start with me. There we go. Do, do, do. I've just made a uh, realized I made quite an error actually. Um, having attended some not, uh, Tech Nuts events, I've realized I've made a deck without any gifts in it. Oh. Which is which is not on not looking after your audience needs, is it? But you know, <laughs> I do wonder. Sorry for the lack of gifts, guys. I do apologise. But uh, there we go. So, shall we crack on, Paul? Are we ready? Yeah. Are you in presentation mode? We can see. Here we go. Hey. Okay. Let's now. go. Right. Brilliant. So, thanks for having me, everybody. I'm Tim Elliott, as I said, and um, I'm here today to talk to you about questions right we live in the world that our questions create so i want to know do you ask good enough questions or do you ask enough good questions in this talk right we're going to explore the power of a good question and how asking a good question can help you create better choices and then make better choices i'm going to share a bit of um my journey with questions uh, and how questions have shaped my career and my life and also i'll share some questions to ask yourself and that you can ask others so that you can apply the power of good questions right to the work that you do but the most importantly i'd be interested in hearing what the hardest question you've been asked is so get your thinking cap on and in a, it, there's an interactive part coming in a few slides time I will give you another heads up to that at that point, but it's also a chance um, to win a lovely book all about questions. Um, so keep your keep your eyes open for that bit and I'll give you a heads up over time. So what is a question? Well, this is the official dictionary definition. I always like to start with a definition because some words in the English language need a bit of clarity. For me, the second point nails it, a matter requiring resolution or discussion. That's beautifully put, I think, Mr. Dictionary Writer. But questions are a bit like doors. They're either opened or they're closed. Open questions require a bit more elaboration in the answers. Right? Right? They can't really be answered with a simple yes or no response unless you're being particularly obtrusive, I think. Um, they're useful for things like creative discussions or maybe critical discussions, critical thinking of finding out more information. A bit of discovery comes from an open question. They open the door to good conversations. And closed questions are the kind of opposite, right? They invite one word answers, such as yes or no. Right. They're popular icebreaker questions because they're dead easy to answer, um, but they close the door on conversations as a rule. Some questions don't require an answer at all. Right. And these are called rhetorical questions like does a bear poop in the woods? I didn't want to swear this early in your day. Uh, is this some kind of joke? And what is the meaning of life? And it's usual answer. How should I know? Some questions have direction, right? They can use to be to funnel a conversation in a certain way, like, what do you do for a living? A designer. Why did you choose to be a designer? And questions can even be used to lead somebody, but you have to be careful when using leading questions because they can, by, can be tricky, right? Like, this talk's going well, isn't it? No technical hitches at all. Um, so some questions even have a twist. A bit of questions. These are the favourite of TV lawyers, and I presume lawyers in real life, but I've not had much dealing with lawyers in real life. Like, have you stopped stealing the office post-its? And some questions are tough to answer. This is the interactive bit, folks, right? I want you in the, in the question area, that I believe we've got, haven't we, Paul? To put the toughest questions you've been asked for a chance to win a book. Now, 
Alec, as you're this thing and there, I believe you're in charge of, uh, of recruitment at BGSS, right? You must have some go-to horrible interview questions, right? Surely. Uh, I would say no, actually. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I think the, the sort of day of those questions has, has had its day as such. I think it's, it's about being inclusive and, and not asking those perhaps deliberately tough questions. Clearly, there are ones that are, are relevant for perhaps senior folks and saying, okay, here's a scenario, how would you deal with that? And that's, that's difficult, but in a way that, okay, actually I had an interview at Google once and you know, they're, they're famous, you know, abstract questions, um, uh, something that perhaps we, we wouldn't do because uh, yeah, I think the psychology shows that that's something that perhaps uh, is unfair sometimes to people uh, and not inclusive. So um, perhaps not the answer you're expecting. No, no, that's, that, that's probably ideal. It's been a long time since I've had a job interview, as you could probably tell. I think it's probably I don't know, 2004, if people are there, you know, yeah, that well. far away. We've had a couple of questions in, actually, uh, which is great. So uh, Zoe put, not an interview question, which is great, um, but one post as a smart child. Is Father Christmas real? Oh, Paul, you're a parent. Have you had that yet? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> that is a toughie. That is a toughie. We didn't have to do that with ours. I, I, think, I think school kids did that on our behalf and just, uh, just taught her not to. So, Kerry put, when's the uni interview a wee while ago? I got asked, who is your hero and why? Who is your hero and why? That's, that's the sort of interview question I remember, Kerry. Like, really throw off, like, why are you brilliant? Or why are you amazing for this job? And I always hated that. Like, I always hated those sort of questions. Maybe it's because my overly Britishness is not very good at, at bragging and, or being all that sort of thing. What's the toughest question I've ever been asked? Jesus, Carl. Maybe this one, maybe this one. Uh, Lee Crosley, I'd like to ask what I do for fun. Uh, what do you do for fun? That is a good question, isn't it? Um, it always makes it sound like really dull in job interviews. That's a good job interview question. But I only like probably being a parent and cooking and running, which is pretty dull life compared to what it was in the younger days. So um, you mentioned uh, Britishness, and that, my answer to this question would be, any question that asks about my personal feelings and emotions, because because that I find that difficult to to, to open up to, um, especially depending on who's asking the question. And I'm, you know, I, I manage people in in my role, and sometimes those are the really difficult conversations where people are struggling, and you're trying to ask the right questions in order to, you know, build that relationship. You know, really understand that. So I I, I think that's something that uh, some of the most difficult conversations. I agree. The questions, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree, definitely. So what we've got going scrolling down, there's some good ones here. Mike Haber, what are your values? That's a toughie. That's a toughie, especially for an individual. I do that. I ask that question a lot with clients and businesses, and they don't know either because it's usually some marketing guy came up with him several years ago, right? And have um and they've just kind of stuck with them because I've wrote them on the canteen wall. So that's always a toughie, Mike. Um, so we put another interview question. Who in your family do you admire the most? Apparently you got it wrong. How have you got it wrong? That's crazy. You're not interviewing and you said your mum, because I can that's the only way I can see. You've got to you've got to say your mum, right? That's not unless, of course, you haven't, but uh, there we go. Great. Well, that's really good questions, people. I'm going to uh, I'm going to carry on with the slide. Thank you very much. Oh, Lee got another one. What is that? Is this the right way of doing it? Can it be cheaper or done for? Oh, Jesus, yeah. Cheaper or faster? There's a, there's famous analogies about client questions who want it done cheaper or faster, isn't it? With doodles, I don't know if you, I've seen them doing the rounds where a guy's sketching a dog. And the, the, if you get it done properly, it's beautiful. And then can you do it in a day? And it's like a, a, a two-year-old left-handed doodle of a dog. That's brilliant. All right, guys, thank you very much for that. There's another interactive bit coming up. So keep your typing fingers ready. So some questions. 
have never been answered. Like, how many universes are there? Like, as a kid, I was proper into space geekery and uh, not quite Simon, uh, what's his name, Professor Cox? Not quite him, but I was into, I was into before him, like, um, I think Johnny Ball did a bit of space. Who was that old guy? Anyway, enough of, enough of those memories. But how, how many universes are there, right? There have been some massively clever folks, like Stephen Hawking, that's who I was, and his original book. I don't know if you guys remember that. Um, but some very clever people have looked into this question, and we still don't know the answer. And then, is there any alien life? Is there really life out there? I'm going to stop the outer space chatter before we go too far down that rabbit hole, or, or should I say black hole? Do you like that? It's a space joke. Space joke. Right, let's move on, I think. Um, in case you haven't guessed, I've always been interested by questions. I must have been a properly annoying kid because I kept asking questions like, well, like is Santa Claus real? But my versions are, what would it be like to be a dog? I asked this about fish too, because as a youth, I was, I was very into fishing, uh, but terrible at it. But I didn't want to share the fish one because I thought it'd make me come across a bit weird. Um, was the Big Bang an accident? Here comes the space bit again. I did say I wasn't going down that. But I did love reading Stephen Hawking's, but I never did. And I probably still don't understand what he was on about. Is there really a God? And if so, how do we know it's not a woman? And which version is it? This is a story that comes out every family Christmas around the, like literally for a good 23 of my 43 years, this question's come out at family Christmases. Because my grandpa, uh, my uh, dad's mum, my nana, was uh, super religious. And I, I always quizzed her apparently at Christmas about this very thing which started off an interesting afternoon of discussion. But anyway, and is there really already a plan for my life? And is this, or is future yet to be written? Because there was loads of stuff about, I think in my family and my parents are having a, like having a fate or a, or a real plan in those days. Because my, I was, when I was little, we had, um, my dad was of the age when he had one job for life. He worked at, for BT for 42 years and then he retired. And my mum worked for Boots for 35 years and then she retired. Right. So I was like, oh, that seems like a very long time as a little kid. So I like to uh, quiz people on the future and things like that. Who am I anyway? Bit of a tricky question. Told you I was a weird kid. Um, what am I for? Now, this is actually... A question that came up uh, during lockdown as well. So I popped into an online event, a festival called Another Door Festival, which was um, about pivoting careers and stuff like that. Um, not that I was pivoting careers, but I was interested in one of the speakers. And that chap was called Michael Owen, not the footballer, the other one, uh, the brand guy. Um, and he spoke on purpose. And he posed this very question in his talk. And, it, and like a lot of people, I imagine, over the last few months, it caused me to kind of reflect on this question myself. Like, what am I for? What do I value? And what do I do next? How do we, you know, does my, does my career of delivering in-person workshops stop? What happens next? So I always, I, I liked what am I for? It was a good question and a good moment at that time. But enough of me being a kid, right? Let, let's get into more practical, more, more my work life, right? And as I entered the world of work, um, one question stuck out for me. And that question is why? And it all started because I started to get, stop reading J.R. Tolkien books and start reading business books because I was a business guy. Um, and these were a couple of my favourites, right? I loved the, the classic idea of asking five whys from this uh, Built to Last book, which is a, a seminal book by um, a very, uh, a very 
incredible American sales guy called Jim Collins. It's actually a really good book if you can get through all the uh, American stuff. Um, and of course, Simon Sinek, which I'm sure we've all heard of because I'm pretty sure he's got 18 million plus views on his start with why TED talk, which by the law of averages, I'm no mathematician, but must mean some of us have watched it. Uh, and for the 20 odd years since I read these books, right, since I, I started getting into work and, and questions related to work, I've noticed that questions pretty much drive everything. So I've been a marketer most of my career. Um, in fact, I started pre-mobile phone, which was uh, the heady days of paper flyers and such. Um, but marketing as a profession is underpinned by questions, right? So that means basically for most of my working life, for about the last 20 years, I've been paid for asking people questions, which is not a bad career. So every effective piece of work in marketing starts with a little diagnosis. And this is where we ask questions like this one. What is the situation? We always need to understand what's actually going on in order to move forward. Right? We need to spend time to understand the status quo and the ecosystem. Um, as, a, as, as the guy said, one of my roles is as an entrepreneur in residence at Nottingham Uni. Um, and as part of that role, I do a little lecturing. Um, so we've got, a, a, it's always interesting, the first semester of lecturing undergrads in um, the, the business and entrepreneurship course there is the whole first semester is on problem definition. Right. And as we, know, as human beings, right, we automatically always jump to solutions. You must have been in meetings before where somebody's already got the answer to the problem that you pose. Right. And it's it's just our natural ability to jump to solutions. So all these eager, young, 18, 19, 20 something kids who are, who are sitting in the first lecture aiming to be taught how to be a successful entrepreneur get told that they've got to spend three months understanding the problem before they're allowed to do any solutions september to december so it's always a bit of a culture shock for them but if companies spent more time on situations right uh, and, and understanding the background and the diagnosis of the situation and the problem or the challenge at hand it really would be a competitive advantage i always start client meetings with a question of have you done any research into this and the answer is well you can guess what the answer is right it's no so another question we marketers we marketers love to ask right we we like to understand the following why do we exist beyond making money it's a bit simon sinek i know i probably borrowed this one um but it helps us understand what our purpose is and, and what's the origin story of the business. You know, the emotive stuff that drives, uh, helps us resonate with the people we choose to serve. It's interesting actually talking about purpose. It, it, for long, it was a bit fluffy, a bit of the woolly kind of fluffy stuff that marketers come up with sometimes. Um, but I listened to an amazing podcast on the Can Lions podcast and it was Alan Jope, the CEO of Unilever. And he'd been uh, measuring purpose-driven brands and non-purpose-driven brands in Unilever's portfolio. And the, the, the growth difference between having a, a purpose-driven story attached is amazing. Uh, you should listen to that if you're interested in purpose. Or I can share it afterwards. Um, also a good one, who do you choose to serve? This one obviously helps us understand the humans that matter to our organizations. Our customers, our colleagues, our stakeholders, who do we choose to serve? Right? And again, it's really interesting that a lot of businesses and people out there don't spend equal enough time to know who this project, who this idea, who this thing is actually for. And then how do we show up, how do we show up is, is answers for marketers, how we deliver on our brand promises, right? How do we 
appear in the world? What what sort of stuff, what sort of labels, what sort of feelings, what sort of experience do we want to be appended with as an organisation or as a professional individual? And then what are we trying to achieve? Pretty simple, right? This one helps us set objectives and KPIs and understand what the opportunity is. But again, it's a question a lot of people, a lot of teams that I work with are just doing activity, like are, are, are looking busy and want to be seen as busy and want to feel busy, but without really understanding what the actual impact is. And impact's an important word because it's not just ticking boxes. It's what actual impact are you making into the world? Um, how do we know if we've been successful? Follows on nicely, right? It, it does what it says on the tin. It's focused on measurement and progress and improvement. And who does what and when? This is a question all about planning, right? This is, shows us who is accountable and, and what are the deliverables and so on. So next in my working life came the um, human-centered design years. So I had enough of marketers and marketers' clients um, and really got into human-centered design and design thinking, which, which again is a thing that's driven by questions. Like Tim Brown from IDEO, which I'm sure you've heard of, says, think of design process as starting with a question, not an answer. We have questions in design thinking that, that create choices, like what if and how might we and how would it be different if and what other way could we right they all open our minds to to divergent thinking right and creative thinking and help us think a bit wider but then we have questions on the other side of the diamond that help us create choices like uh sorry make choices like which ideas shall we test for so speaking of ideas this is one of my favorite little uh, tools that I use with clients. Uh, it's called the Idea Daisy because, excuse, I oh, know there's probably a bunch of designers in the room, so excuse my terrible canvas skills. Um, <clears throat> but you can ask questions to validate ideas. Um, I use this all the time with clients to, to make sure they really have thought through their idea. So it's got what problem does it solve? What's the opportunity? What will it make better? Why is it amazing? Who cares? And can you describe it in a sense? Love that little daisy. Like, we'll, we'll, like the recording of this will be up as well if you want to use it. It's not, a, you know, it, it's free off, but it, it's a great little tool for developing ideas. But it's not the only one. There's, um, this is a, a big list of 23 idea qu testing questions, right? There, there's so many questions you can use to test ideas um oh there's loads to validate ideas i've highlighted some of some good ones here so is it a new idea how big is the change it will make like i said earlier i'm very driven by impact over activity so what is the big change it will make what is the niche how big is the niche it's great to have an idea but there might be a, a gap in the market that you're looking for but is there a market in the gap to use that uh, age old phrase and where will it be in five years time i love where will it be in five years time because it it helps us think a bit more long term because because a lot of businesses especially over the last few months have had to think super short term right and we get and, and the smaller the business are getting stuck into a little kind of 90 day cycle and it's really hard to achieve massive things if you're thinking in a 90 day cycle so what's your story? So nowadays, I generally work with, with leaders and entrepreneurs through the university and uh, as a private consult, consultant to help, um, to help them tell their story, right? To, to design a narrative around a product or a purpose or a service. But stories start by answering questions too, right? We've got what was, what is, and what could be. These are three questions that have been asked about stories since 330 BC. And our old mate, Aristotle, right? He came up with, uh, with poetics at that time and it was one of the first teachers and speakers about, about narrative and story and how it resonates. But these three little questions, what was, what is, and what could be, help us 
create a narrative with a beginning, a middle and an end, right? Again, Aristotle's three act structure that's still used today to do all the stuff that we consume, theatre, TV, shows, that sort of thing. And of course, the most important tool in storytelling is a question. And then what happened? So we're coming in into the final few furlongs. So I hope you haven't got question fatigue as yet. And to change it up, I want to start, I want to begin the ending with a statement, not a question, right? Question everything. I want to champion curiosity. You should all be curious because curiosity doesn't kill cats. It, it opens doors. We should all take time to look round corners we've not looked around before because there's always interesting stuff. And there's, you can kind of rely on the, the next person or the next guy or the, or the competing agency or designer or whatever is probably not doing that. So curiosity is an amazing thing to drive, drive success and creativity in the end. Good questions, you see. They should challenge assumptions. We all make assumptions in our work. I mean, me especially in the, in the creative run, right? We have to make assumptions and then prove them true, right? And good questions help us challenge assumptions. Good questions should always cause the receiver to stretch. They shouldn't be easy to answer, right? They shouldn't be an easy way out. They should cause a bit of thought because then the answer is going to be awesome. And good questions encourage breakthrough. But remember, there's two sides to questioning. It's not just words, right? It's not just saying the words. You've got to listen as well. My mum used to say we have uh, two hours and one more mouth for a reason and I should use them in, uh, in that ratio, right? We should use them twice as much. And she's probably right based on the, the questions I asked her as a kid. Can you explain it in a sentence, right? You know if you've listened well because you can, you can explain the reply in a sentence. It's technically called mirroring, I think. If you, if you take a summer uh, a, a chance to summer summarize sorry <laughs> falling over my words a bit there um take a chance to summarize the answer in a sentence and and speak it back to the person that you're with it's called mirroring i think i learned that at, at chris boss's masterclass if you haven't got that um the question on the slide also helps us look at the, the other side of questioning communication, right? It helps our communications become more effective too, because we as the human race don't have masses of attention at the moment, right? So it's clarity and conciseness is, is, is very key. I think it was Mark Twain that, that once said, I apologize, I don't have, uh, I've wrote you such a long letter. I don't, I don't have time to write you a short one because being concise is a real skill and, uh, and it's kind of difficult. So here's, to round off, right, there's um, some of my fave questions. Now, folks, listen up, because this is, uh, in a few sides, there's going to be the second chance for you to win another book. And this time, start thinking about the favourite questions you want to ask. We're going to open the question thing in a bit. I'm going to a uh, couple more slides until then. So to get you guys thinking about your favourite questions and maybe maybe stimulate a few ideas, here are a few of, of my favourites. Are the questions we ask more valuable than the answers? It's a biggie, right? What do you think? Is knowledge a commodity? Are the questions more valuable than the answers? Love that one. And why are you in business? Again, this is a, 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 a cool little trick that I use with clients. I always ask them, why are you in business? And then they, they explain the real, uh, uh, a real reason followed instead of what do you do? So why are you in business? Which is followed up by, so what business are you really in? And it also makes them think and, and helps create discussion within leadership group. But it's a really good idea.
And then what if, full of possibilities this one, love what if. And then what's next, which always keeps us moving forward, always gives us a bit of kind of momentum with what's next. How might, there's a bunch of people that use how might we on a, on a daily basis, but it's the start of many, many challenges and cool workshops. And now we know this, what's possible now? This comes from the world of constant improvement. It's uh, one of my favorite things actually to do is the rule of one more. I'll just diverge into this a little bit, sorry. Um, can you imagine how cool organizations be if every time we learned something as individuals, we taught one more person? It's like Seth Godin says, one of my favorite guys to follow on the, on the internet. Um, he says we're all teachers and I'm a massive fan of that, that thesis, that idea. So I always try and encourage people to, to teach one more person everything you learn rather than sit and understand it yourself. And then, is it good for the planet? It's a big question, right? And one that I think should be asked every day for the next couple of decades. It's one I've been asking a lot more to the people I work with. Uh, and is it good for the people? One that should have probably been asked for the last 20 years, but maybe wasn't. Um, everything we do should be good for people or good for planet. I don't think there's much room for the shallower stuff at the moment. And then what is the game changing question we need to ask? So this is another workshop favorite. I always, uh, it's a bit of a doozy in Flummox's people. If we start with asking a question about what question should we actually ask? What question, if answered, will make the biggest impact? I, it births so much creativity and innovation. Really love this question. And plus, who doesn't want to change the game, right? I do, for one. This is it, this is the interactive bit number two, the final chance to win another book. So put your fave questions in the book and let's see what they are. Have we got some coming in the book? Let me scroll down. Um, how do you define creativity and what is creativity for you by Carl Jeffries? Was that one of your favorite ones? That is a toughie. How do you define creativity? Creativity is one of those British words, one of those lovely English words that means so much stuff. It comes with so much baggage. Like you're creative if you knit pigeon key rings and sell them on Etsy. And you're creative if you're Dave Grohl from the Food Fighters. You're creative if you're the, the Mr. Dyson who makes all the, all the cool hoovers. And you're creative if you're me. Right? Some guy works on his own helping people tell better stories. Like really good one, Cole. Really good one. Have we got any more coming in? What about you, you chaps? Paul, Paul, Alec? Have you got any faves? <laughs> that, was a, that was a good one from, from Carl. So Carl is actually a professor of creativity. And yeah. he goes around asking that question all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he's actually going to be speaking at Techfest next year. Uh, so good morning, Carl. Good question. Morning, Carl. Good uh, segue. Good question. Uh, I, 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 read, I can't remember what the book was called. I think it, I read a book recently. It was by a guy called Warren Berger. Uh, and it was called The Book of Beautiful Questions. Yeah. And he had this question in there that he said, what's your tennis ball? And, and by that, he had this whole story about his dog and having a tennis ball and going out and constantly throwing this ball and this dog would just keep going after it. Uh, so I, I thought that's quite a nice question. You know, what's, your, what's your tennis that's ball? What, what, is, what is it? I mean, completely um, the other end of the spectrum, it, it's cliche and dangerous to use it too much, but I think you can't beat a classic, a classic why. That, that's, that's the <laughs> classic question. But, you know, some people go into the, the why, why, why too much, but you know, the, I, I like the really sort of open ones. And I think with questions as well, and particularly with uh, perhaps interviews that we talked about earlier, is people ask a question and then can be, a, a, you know, want to fill that space if there's no immediate response. But I often find it really powerful to, to leave, that, leave that bit of silence and, and, and wait for that to be filled. Because you can ask a really good question and if someone doesn't answer it immediately, you start 
adding leading questions and, and, and doing that. So you sometimes you don't really get back what you're looking for. But, you know, you can set it up to say, have a, have a real think about that for 30 seconds and then let me know the answer. So that's something that I guess I try and do as a, you know, it's not a question, but it's just that sort of technique, I suppose, of, of asking questions. Yeah, that's a good yeah. one. That's a good, yeah. Why, why is a classic, right? Why is a, why is a, why is a, why is a classic and underused? So we've got, um, we've got a good one from Lee Crossley. Uh, hi, Lee. Um, does Mr. Dyson make hoovers? <laughs> Yeah, see what you've done there, very clever. And how do you define success? Oh my God, that's another cracking interview question, Claire Duckett, for asking in the chat. And what else have we got? Let's scroll down a little bit. Just following on from Alex's and uh, uh, when, when you ask them the questions that they ask, in my, in my role, when I'm walking around um, looking at what teams are doing, it's really difficult to figure out whether you know they're potentially doing the right thing or, or they could be doing something slightly better. The best way to kind of tease that out is to just ask people if they're proud of what they're doing. If, if you're proud of your work, generally that, that shines through really, really easily. Um, and we should kind of all ask ourselves that every kind of morning when we're, when we're working, saying, are we actually proud of what we're doing? You know, are we pleased with it? And if not, then do something to change that. Yes. Yeah. Dangerously closely to the viral, does it bring you joy? That, uh, you know, that, that, that was a question everyone was asking themselves probably last year when that program came out. But it is, it is relevant. You know, it is we'll call it a unique twist on that, shall we? Right, I, it, I think it's better. You've refined it. Does it spark joy? Spark Alec, joy. Does it spark Sorry. joy? Oh. Let's get spark. Spark. Oh. He didn't come up with that. <laughs> no. I love great. that cleaning lady. That's great. I, I, I always, um, when I run teams over the uh, built teams over the last couple of years i always tried to encourage them to do work they're proud of because if they if they think it's all right then i'm not really like interested like it should be something like you should have ideas you want to fight for right so i love that so we've got a few more questions coming in uh, dimple says who inspires you and why that's a good question it's a good question i reckon inspiration's everywhere but it's nice in little people so candy got a long one what are the things you get to do at work and what are the things you have to do? Yeah. What is just the normal part of your job that you have to get done? What makes you happy? Nice, Kerry. What do you think is a good question? Um, I'm inspired by Nancy Klein. Time to think, Claire Duckett. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, good. So there's some really good little questions, right? I really like, I really like what Lee said um, about does this make you proud and what Kerry says what makes you happy um which is which is great right so we're on to the final furlongs folk we'll announce the books at the end shall we Paul I've got uh, yeah is that, we, is that all right we will have to because we'll need the people that are the winners to to let us know how to get the book to them cool okay well I've got a couple of ideas I don't know if you if you have but anyway I'll carry on we're nearly at that point we're nearly at the end where you get to ask me questions. Interesting time. Right, here we go. So there's only one more slide after this, right? And then there's that chance for, for you to ask me questions or, or, or the guys there. Um, but I wanted to post this tweet by Mr. Mark Manson, who, who wrote the, the famous book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F, um, because it made me question questions, right? And, and this tweet is something I'm currently questioning and I'm currently curious about. Um, so he's, a, he's obviously a, a, an author and a guru-y type guy. So he's got, he's got some kind of credibility or, or some kind of voice that people follow. And he says that life is about not knowing and doing it anyway. Um, so it reminds me of the question earlier, is knowledge a commodity, right? Is curiosity still cool? Should we all have a plan or a purpose to follow? Right? Should we all know where we're going? Because I've always thought, if you don't know where you're going, how are you going to get there? But this guy he is causing me to challenge that. Like, what do you think? I'm just going to leave this here in your mind as we move on to the final slides. Um, and I want to end 
how I started this little bit and and a, a sub a sub theme of the of the questions talk is and books about questions probably should have been a good subtitle um and I've saved my real favorite question to the end and 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 another book this one on the screen the one thing and I reread this book at least once a year and have done for donkeys for about a decade um and it really helps me kind of simplify life and go back to the thing because I'm, I'm one of those guys that likes a bunch of stuff and at some point you need to kind of narrow it down and focus a little bit so the question in this book is what's the one thing i can do such by doing it everything else will be easier or unnecessary so what's the one thing I can do such by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary. So that's a question that I've been able to point at work stuff with clients, with life stuff, but it really helps you understand how to focus. And that is the end of the questions presentation. I will stop sharing and then we'll announce and chat around who's won the books, if that's cool, Paul. Here we are. Yes. Good man, good man. So, out of the first book, which, uh, which is the, the, what was it, the, 30, the Beautiful Questions one, right? Yeah, oh, so cool. I think we'll go with that one. It's uh, a book by Warren Berger and it's called uh, A Book of Beautiful Questions. Uh, <clears throat> and it is, it's a really great book. It's actually filled with really great questions, but stories around it. So it's got stories around uh, why four-year-old girls ask the most questions uh, <laughs> out of everybody. And they ask apparently like something like 300 a day or something. I was like, wow, no wonder my brain's fried. Uh, yeah, so there's loads of loads of background into different types of questions around creativity and around uh, leadership, self development. Uh, put some really great stories as well in there. So we'll we'll make sure that that a copy of that gets sent to the winner of the first round. And I don't know, Ali, what do you think? That yeah. first set of questions. There were some good ones in there. There were some good ones. I quite liked the one. Where is it now? So we, turn, uh, we bring up Christmas for the first time this year. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Disqualified. <laughs> <laughs> I like the one from Kerry around the superhero one. I think I would have. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. That's good. What, who is your hero and why? Yeah, a uni interview as well. I mean, it's not even a job interview, is it? It's like you're going into to uni. It's like, yes, you're okay. Uh, so Kerry, we'll, we'll send you a copy of the book of beautiful questions. Uh, what I would ask is if you can get in touch with either myself uh, or Alec uh, and, and we'll make sure that we get a copy sent to you uh, via our favourite book delivery service. That's good. Right. So on to the second one, which is a copy of the one thing, the book that was in the final slide, um, which is God. So your favourite questions on there. Oh, Kerry's done another one. What makes you happy? We can't, we can't double up on Kerry. <laughs> I, I, I would nominate Claire for both volume and quality of her contributions because she is. She is. <laughs> several and uh, already, already good as well. So into question. Would, uh, Claire Duckett would be my, my nomination. Do you know what? I will go with that. I will go with that. I like Claire's final question. What is the first thing I can do to inspire change in my organisation? I'm fully behind that, Claire. So congratulations. Do the same thing. Get in touch with Alec and Paul and I'll get a copy of the one thing to them or to you via them. One or the other. But it will come. <laughs> well done. Well, congratulations, people. Yay. So shall we open up for, for questions now, Tim? Really enjoyed that. It was really yeah. good. I really like the kind of tried to kind of make it a bit more interactive i think that's a great way to go uh, so I, I guess i've got a question i mean uh I, do you keep a lit have you got like a little collection of questions that you collate because you're a bit geeky about it i know that i, I yeah. started doing this about about i don't know six months ago and, and, and tried to categorize them and, and almost like a little collection if you like do you know what uh, absolutely 
Yeah, I have, um, I'm a big fan of creating a swipe file on stuff that interests me and questions is one of those and as well as, you know, just things that spark my interest because I think naturally I have a rubbish memory. I need some kind of way of capturing all the input that we get nowadays. So I have a swipe file on questions and a list of a few and then for, and for quotes and stuff like that, there's some good ones, but that's where most of the, the fave ones come from because I couldn't think of them myself. So I scrolled down the list and went, oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Let's do that. No, it's, it's definitely because uh, you always forget, don't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've just got a stand like a bog standard text file on my phone, like, you know, just, and every time you see something, you go, okay, well, I'll stick that one in there. Uh, but it, you know that it's readily available if you need it. Yeah. 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 I love it. I love a swipe file. My, uh, my, my Google Keep and Google Drive has many, many, many files into it. I think I've got one separately on Curiosity, which is a bit, a bit meta, but it's kind of the same. But that's good. Uh, nice. So, if you've got any questions for Tim, if you want to submit them via the Q and A, and we will open up the uh, mic for you. In the meantime, I'm just going to say hello to Carl. Carl Jeffries. Good morning. Carl Jeffries. Hello, uh, hello, Paul. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thanks. So I've got to ask you about your creativity question, right? Because you must have an answer oh. by now. I do. I do have an answer. Yeah, I don't know if my videos on. I don't know, if, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's a whole. Um, you know, you might steal me thunder a bit here. It's one of these things as a creativity coach, you want, you want to hold back on some of that. <laughs> but I will, I will tell you what it is for me after years of thinking. I, again, like um, like we were saying, uh, you know, there's a lot of different answers to it. But for me, creativity is three words and it is finding novel answers. That's nice. Oh, that's what it is i mean there's a lot more complexity out there and that is a school of thought you know what i mean so i'm i'm not looking at certain things and i'm playing down other stuff but for me it's it's finding novel answers it's a it's a process it's focused on the novel not always the useful more than than that and it's focused on uh, some sort of like in you know it's got a question that's the key thing implied behind that is there's a question that fires up my search curiosity for yeah I, I i was sorry there was a bit of a lag call didn't mean to interrupt go no. for it all right I, I i was thinking i i had a portion a very small percentage of my brain i uh, thinking about that since you put it in the chat last time um and the two words that, that came to the front of my head were, was value creation, like something to do with value creation. For me, what creativity means. But, um, mm. but that's as far as I've got. It's not a fully formed sentence, obviously. But, you know. <laughs> I, I, think, I think the great thing is, like you say, is, is how many different ways it gets interpreted. And what I find for creatives is they often have all these cultural things get dumped on them about creativity. And, and sometimes it's really useful to think, what, what do you actually mean by that? And are you being straight jacketed into a perception of it being about artistic or, you know, creativity or as a talent in it, you, you know, you can't teach it. All these sorts of myths that really can tie you up if you're not careful. Yeah. It's definitely a, it's definitely an interesting topic. Like the, the amount of people, like I did a workshop just before, uh, just before COVID happened in February with a group of engineer leaders who, um, when I asked, it was on, on kind of creative leadership and, and like cross-functional creative schools, like collaboration and, and communication and stuff. And they're really like superb engineers. But when I started by asking who is creative, in a room of engineer leaders, all in grey or navy suits with red ties, obviously. Um, like not what, I think maybe one of them put their hand up a little bit, but some of them like literally invented new stuff. 
like the epitome of creativity, right? They came up with whole new things that didn't exist before. Like, so it's always, it's always interesting to what, what baggage of creativity comes with to people, I think, trying to unpack that. Great. No, uh, good to hear from you, Carl. Uh, uh, we're just conscious of, of time. Uh, so we're going to kind of wrap things up. Uh, Carl's going to be speaking with us uh, next year, more, more about creativity, I imagine, or are you picking a, a different area, Carl? What do you reckon? Oh, I'm, I'm, well, let's talk. Let's talk. What, you know, <laughs> so, see, see what the people want. Yeah. Good, good look at the Design Ops Conference. I uh, hope that goes well for you. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Speak to you soon. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, really great talk. Really love the interactions. Uh, we'll get those books out to Clary. Uh, Clary? Merge them together. Kerry and Claire. Uh, as soon as we, we get the uh, address details and uh, we look forward to seeing you again at this time next month uh, we'll be talking about DevOps. Okay, have a great day. See you later.